Fundamentals of Mixing, lesson number six, uh, pre-mix preparation, uh, speakers and monitoring is what we're going to talk about today. So um, I'm not going to get into a whole big thing about uh, selecting speakers and all of those sorts of things. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, what I wanted to focus on um, uh, to begin with is maybe just a little bit of a conceptual idea about how to approach a particular uh, situation or layout. So I wanted to start with something that would be, you know, maybe a uh, um, a stock, you know, whatever, a room. Most rooms are, are rectangular. Uh, so, and I'll set up a pair of monitors and kind of draw this as uh, best that I can in perspective. Um, when, um, when setting up uh, a set of speakers, uh, one of the things that's most important, and you think, well, you know, do you really need to get into this as far as, you know, the actual, yeah, I'll get something that's relatively close here in a second. There we go. It's a little bit better. I can live with that. Uh, so I have a set of speakers here. When I when I set them up, and, and the setup of the speakers is critically important to all the things that I'm going to teach. Um, the reason why I brought this in, because some people are going to want to see, like, I want audio examples, and I want you to show me why filtering is the best thing ever, or panning and, you know, uh, you know levels are the best thing ever, or, you know, whatever special technique. But it all starts with this, because if this isn't set up correctly, then what ends up happening is that uh, you end up with garbage. You end up with something that, you know, more or less uh, is not going to... Um, you know, work as well, because you're not going to be able to hear what's going on as effectively. And so the reason why I um, kind of start with this basic uh, fundamental um, thing here and, and way of operating is that I want you to kind of understand that if you have this set up correctly, then, uh, then everything that you do will sort of be an extension, will, will kind of work from that. So let me just kind of set up uh, the, you know, listener's uh, position right here. I'm just going to move this around uh, just a little bit. Um, in, in setting up the speakers, the one basic principle that's important to understand is to triangulate yourself. So you see this in any speaker manual or anything that you got. And essentially what it means is that um, the distance between the speakers should be the same as the distance it is from your head, you know, so that, and, and this is not always possible in every situation, but that's the ideal scenario. The speakers are going to be angled as such as in that they're not pointed um, towards, uh, and in fact, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to throw another layer on to the top here. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, so I have that. Okay, so right up here. Um, the speakers, the tweeter element in particular, is going to be pointed towards the ear, right? And so that it hits a point a foot behind the head. So when you actually set this up and rig this up, the speakers are not pointed towards the center of your head. That is actually the case in uh, when you're working with surround system. So if you have a center channel, each, each speaker is equidistant from the center of your head. So like if you put a big spike in the center of your head and attached a string to it at a certain length, the speakers in the whole surround system would be an equal distance from the center of your head and the spike that's in the middle of it. So um, in in this particular case, what, and that's just like that simple thing ends up being important. So when setting up the speakers and setting up a space, and even for people who have gone through and acoustically treated the spaces, I've found and I've walked into many of these sort of home studio spaces and after about five minutes, uh, most of the time I can make everything in that space sound better just by positioning the speakers in a better way. I went to um, one of uh, my uh, students, a uh, former student actually, who has a studio in Los Angeles and I went to visit his space and I was looking at the way the monitors were set up and where they were set up and I looked at it and it's like, you know, when I listen to your mixes, like I can understand why you have difficulty with the depth perspective in this. And so I spent a little time with him and I said, okay, what if we set up the speakers like this and kind of move some things around and set them up like this? And they listened and it was like this huge revelation, you know, like his eyes got like really wide, you know, um, and, and was like listening. It's like, oh my God, there's like all this stuff that I never really heard before. And it's like, yeah. The speakers need to be set up in a particular way. And if you don't set them up in that particular way, you're not going to get the most out of them. So whatever you spend, whether you spent, you know, um, $400 for your pair or $4,000 for your pair, if they're not set up right, you're not going to get the most out of whatever it is that they have.
So when positioning um, the speakers, and actually what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, uh, leave that here for a second or undo that move just so it's, it is where it is. Hide that level. I'm going to go back to this level here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this around the room. So one of the things that in setting up speakers in a space, and you don't have to start over, but I'll give you the quick uh, notes of the way that I do it. If I, if I have a new space, what I do is I set up the speakers. Um, I feed a signal into it. So I'll, I'll have my laptop, a laptop or something with the speakers. Um, and I'll set them up in the room. I'll put them up on stands. I'll have my chair in there and nothing else in the room, completely naked room, empty, whatever it is in there, just empty. And what I'll do is I'll walk the space with the speakers, meaning that I'll take it and I'll kind of say, all right, well, how far away from the wall? What happens as I'm moving this setup around and I'm listening to music? What's the best positioning? And then I'll say, well, maybe I need to, you know, flip my whole setup around. You know how hard it is to do this in real life? Um, and then, you know, and so I go over, over to this side. And so I'm kind of balancing out that and it's like, okay, you know, what do they sound like here? Does it work better here? And maybe I'll, you know, go like this. It's like, okay, well, what does it sound like if I work, you know, from this perspective, you know, where now, um, you know, I'm going from this perspective and listening from here. Um, there's a couple things that, that are really important about, working this and really paying attention to is what it is that you hear and what you focus on. When you set up speakers in a room, you want to focus not on the frequency response, um, but on the imaging. So somewhat on the frequency response, but that's going to be a byproduct of the imaging of the room. You want to find the positioning of the speakers that gives you the best clarity and imaging and focus of individual instruments, period. Um, the, the frequency response and all of those things are much easier to deal with uh, than anything else that you'll ever, you know, uh, that you'll ever do. So if you find that this is the best place, I have never found in any situation where speakers like this, speakers in a corner, offset, anything other than them being symmetrically placed in the room, if at all possible, and at at least a you know couple foot or meter dif distance away from the wall, is very effective. Uh, a lot of these decisions and placements are based on the size and dimensions of the space. Um, it's actually in some ways sometimes more predictable and easier to work in a rectangular space than it is than one that's uneven or odd shaped. Um, but you work with the best within what you essentially have. And the things that are important here about this triangulation in this setup is that you're getting the most accurate center image strength. One thing that you have to understand is that when you set up speakers, the wider you move the speakers apart, the weaker the center image is going to become, the weaker the center image strength is going to become. And the closer you move them together, the more they mono up and the stronger the center image strength. So just like when you take a balance control and uh, on a stereo mix, and you move that balance and you narrow it and you mono it up, the center image gets louder. That's, that's just exactly like what happens when you move speakers closer together or farther away. So as you spread things wider, the center strength weakens. Now, you can compensate for this with pan law settings. Depending upon the application, you could set you know, uh, pan law settings to be you know, minus 3 or minus 2.5 or any of those types of things to balance it out. The key is... Um, that in setting it up like this, you want to listen to music that you know well and set up and define the settings so that the speakers with existing commercially released music sounds as good as it possibly can. In other words, when you switch from song to song in different styles and all different types of things, you want to be able to monitor this and say, you know what, when I listen in this particular position with this particular setup, everything actually sounds really clear, right? The imaging, I can hear the distance of the vocal, the separation of the individual instruments. I can get some perception of the depth. Um, the other thing that's important is the height of the speakers. The height of the tweeter has to be at exactly your ear height in, um, because um, high frequency signals are the most directional. Um, so the low frequency driver can be lower towards your chest, that's fine. That high frequency driver needs to be up um, at ear level. If you're working with something like an NS10, which was designed to lay flat, and you could tell just by looking at it, the tweeter always goes to the outside. And it usually is outside and high, never to the inside. Um, 
And so when you set this up, you're angling the tweeter element towards the ear because that's the most directional element. The low frequency driver is going to be the least directional what comes out of that speaker. Okay, so what's most directional is going to be in the upper mid range, and that's going to be uh, mids and upper mids, which will usually be in any crossover uh, speaker system will be set up that way. If you have a subwoofer, um, the placement of the subwoofer is important. And in general, um, my rule about this, because you could put it in the corner off to the side, and that's great for home stereo systems. For the most part, um, it, it doesn't have to be perfectly aligned uh, with the with the speakers themselves in terms of being in between, but generally you want it center place. You want to work with the position front back to find the right phase response. You, you should spend time finding the right correct crossover point, etc. When listening and kind of monitoring, you know, uh, keeping in mind the Fletcher Munson curves, you want to get some kind of sound pressure level meter. And so if you're operating at 85 dB SPL as you're monitoring, you're getting the most out of what it is and you're balancing things out from that level. Um, the, uh, the frequency response patterns, and you could do frequency analysis, is educational in that it shows you where problem areas are. But you may find if you just follow that, you may find that you put the speakers in some spot in the room where the frequency response is more or less flat at the sweet spot, but the imaging really sucks. And the imaging being better is going to work a thousand times better for everything that you do than the frequency response being balanced. And this will kind of come out as, as the, you know, as all of this progresses and the information comes out. So the height is critically important. The layout of it is incredibly important. And the distance is also critically important. Most of these desks, these work desks, audio work desks, where they have little leafs for the speakers to sit on, most of the time they're too far apart you know, on the bigger ones, and they're way too close to you. That can work for smaller speakers. The bigger the monitor, the farther away from it you, you need to be. You can find out what the sweet spot is by setting up your speakers, pointing them, you know, as close as you can, more or less, to your ears, like I was just saying, and then moving your chair back and forth. So if you actually, if you actually take this and, you know, and you just say, all right, I'm going to go forward. I'm going to move my chair backward. You're going to find a spot where it's like that image as well. Okay. That just like, that sounds really good. Now the speaker seems to be like, you're, you're finding that point at which the low frequency driver and the high frequency driver are in correct phase with each other. It will just, everything will just seem to like be focused and more solid. And you may need to move that monitor a little bit wider if you have to step away farther. The bigger the monitor, the farther away that you need to be from it. So in Whitney's studio, when I was working in Whitney's studio, her private studio, she had these Quested monitors that literally had four 15-inch drivers in each cabinet, left and right. It was a four-way system. Um, so uh, the there was literally... <laughs> uh, there were there were literally uh, two thousand watt amps that were driving for each low low uh, frequency uh, pair of drivers on the left and the right side. So there were four thousand watts of amplification on the low end coming from these speakers. They literally weighed five hundred pounds. Um, they were soffited in the wall, and they were at a good distance. So when you listen to them, it's like they sounded really amazing. What was really amazing about this is that in working there in studios with Bobby Brown, and I did a bunch of work with Bobby as well as Whitney, um, they were together at that time when I was working with him in the studio, is that he would go in and um, I would immediately put on earplugs. Like he would turn up, like he would go in and he would just turn everything up to 11, you know, and, and the SSL console they had there actually did go up to 11, <laughs> you know. So uh, if you've watched Spinal Tap, you understand what that means. Um, but he would go in and he would just turn it up. I remember one day we were getting an average SPL level of 129 um, on average. 129 on average. You know, so that's not peak level. That's like, you know, it's like average level. So just like earplugs in, you know, and, you know, going in. And, um, and so uh, he was... He listened so loud that even though the, the whole studio was properly floated and, and set up, um, the the amount of low frequency driving into the ground because the speakers were mounted on these cement blocks um, that uh, were were driven directly into the ground but completely isolated and floated independently. Uh, they weren't floated. They were 
grounded perfectly. Um, and the speakers were mounted on those platforms, but the floor of the control room was completely floated independent of the pads that those things were on. So these huge cement blocks, uh, it actually set off perimeter alarms around the property. That's how much the vibrational energy went down into the rest. And, and it's not like the property, like the fence was, you know, just outside the house. I'm talking about, you know, like hundreds of yards away from the studio <laughs> is where the property lines were. So this is something that, you know, uh, just like an absurd aside there uh, for those monitors. But those little freaking, you had to be a good 10 or 12 feet, you know, four meters away from it in order for you to perceive them accurately. And if you were any closer than that, it would just be this big smear of sound. Okay, so that's an important thing. Um, the size of the monitors have to be appropriately sized to the space that you're working in. You're better off with a, with a subwoofer and smaller speakers in a smaller room than you are in bigger speakers with a 10 or 12 inch driver in, in a small room that's, you know, uh, three meters by four meters or nine feet by 12 feet, you know. Um, so you have to be really, really conscious of that, right? So there's there's some things about this and the imaging is critical. So when you work with uh, treatments and spacing, the most important treatments and what you're trying to achieve is what is called a reflection-free zone. Um, a reflection-free zone is an area where, um, here, let me just add a layer on here for a second. Um, a reflection-free zone is an area that um, is meant to uh, triangulate, oops, uh, let me do it this way, go here. It's an area that, that somewhat um, works around the mixed position and it's meant to be free of reflections. Now it's never gonna be, it's not gonna be, not gonna be possible to make that perfectly reflection free. But early reflection free is the better thing because room uh, no, sound is going to bounce around the room and it's going to ra radiate back. You want it to radiate back in less than in greater than 20 milliseconds, ideally, so it becomes reverberant energy and doesn't affect the original. So acoustic treatments generally, if you add a limited number of them, are best at a position here on the side, here on the side. Spacing from the wall quite often is important uh, above uh, the listening position over um you notice that this is set up an area if you imagine the sound from the speaker is bouncing off this wall and hitting your side ear you're getting your most heavy absorption in that early reflection area same there same up above so anything that bounces off the ceiling doesn't triangulate perfectly you're minimizing the effect of that um, and if you're close to the back wall then you're going to have some rear absorption as well and um and so as you kind of work around, there are some other angles that things may reflect at. So you may find that you need, you know, some, uh, you know, um, acoustic barriers that are back here or whatever, maybe some things up front to kind of help with resonance and things like that. Those general setup things, though, are the most critical. You want to minimize early reflections. That will significantly improve the quality of your monitoring and the accuracy of the monitoring and the imaging of the monitoring. So even if you add limited acoustic treatments and you work with this basic thing before you started moving other stuff into the room, then you would understand like how powerful that is in terms of setting up the imaging. Because all the things that I'm going to talk about in, in this fundamentals of mixing class or these lessons is going to be about imaging depth clarity, being able to hear height in a mix, front back depth in a mix, left width in a mix. And if you're not monitoring properly, then that's all going to kind of go out the window. So in so this is an important principle, and it's only going to help you in terms of the way that you mix. Now, I understand that sometimes people, you know, you're mixing in your bedroom, you know, or your setup is limited. It has to be against the wall or something like that. Uh, any way that you can move things around or change things around to come close to making it sound better as possible, you want to make every effort to to do that and and kind of work with it. Um, you can also monitor at lower volumes uh, and balance your subwoofer up a little bit to kind of bring back some of the low end. So if you're in a situation where you can't really listen loud or the new room resonates uh, too easily when you turn up the speakers to 85 dB SPL, then you could start to work with the speakers at a lower listening volume, but bring up the subwoofer to, if you have one to balance out the low frequency response. Uh, work with the settings on your speakers, maybe to balance out the high frequencies so that at a lower listening volume, you're getting a more balanced frequency spectrum. And then kind of set that, mark that 
and use that as a working level when you start mixing. Um, that's an uh, that's one way that you can help to to do things uh, that that you know will work better or make your results better. The other thing is working with headphones. The limitations um, with headphones there are many of them, um, but um, essentially, if you imagine uh, taking your two speakers. Uh, shrinking them down and strapping them to either side of your head with a little thing over the top that keeps them attached. That's more or less what headphones are. So uh, if the the uh, triangulation of the speakers isn't uh, now is out the window. So now the left speaker is never feeding into the right ear and the right speaker is never feeding into the left ear except for through the head. And uh, so it's far more limited in terms of the way that that works. Um, you can use plugins. One of the ones that uh, I've recommended if you watched uh, some of the videos, excuse me, uh, that's our plugin of the week. You're going to see that a little later. Uh, if, if it were on a, on a mix bus, this would be the last plugin. It might be something like 112db.com, you know, the Redline monitor. Um, in, um, and the idea of setting this up as your setting speaker angle uh, positioning distance that you are monitoring from it and the idea would be that you would try to set up something this there's, there's no room coloration um, or there's no um, like some plugins like the um, waves NX um, uh, the uh, ARC system uh, by IK multimedia um, there's another one um, uh, there's a whole bunch of, of companies now that that have plugins that do similar types of things. One of the things I like about this one is there's no extra room treatment. Some of them emulate specific speaker systems. Uh, New Audio Technologies is another one uh, that that's very that's quite good. They actually have impulse responses of particular control rooms, so you can select different control rooms, and uh, you could do whole surround setups. Uh, more and more of these are coming out. Uh, NX is quite good because it it um, takes into consideration the shape of your head and the measurements of your head into getting your headphones to kind of work correctly. Uh, this this one, but that also has some, it has some ambient energy into it. Now, that's what happens when you listen to your speakers in your control room. So you have to factor that in. But um, there is an amount of time if you start working with plugins like the NX that it takes to get used to that. In other words, you have to use it a lot and you have to listen to a lot of music on it. At first, it's going to sound really off, weird, and and a little whacked out. So you have to work with the settings and then you have to kind of work with it on a regular basis. The, the cool thing with the NX is that it actually tracks your head movements. You can turn that off. Um, but in, um, you know, sometimes that's helpful if you want that more realistic experience. Like if you're in the control room, it, it at first feels weird because what you see is not what you're hearing. <laughs> you know, in other words, your brain very carefully makes calculations. When you sit behind your speakers in your room, so you know that room, your brain has got it very well calculated. You listen to speakers, it all sounds natural, just sounds like very clean and unaffected, but it is very affected. You just don't notice it that way because your brain is compensated for all of those things. Uh, this one is good because it's just, it's just feeding delayed signal from the left into the right and from the right into the left. And that helps to change uh, the setup. You want to be very careful to set the center image strength with the level control here because when that is correct and it should match the way that your monitors are, then when you place this on, you know, uh, it's good. When you, They say to just put it, it's the last plug-in on the mix bus. Uh, you could turn it on or off, bypass it. Make sure you bypass it when you go back to speakers. <laughs> That's probably the biggest thing, you know, with any of those monitoring things. Otherwise, you're going to be doubling the effect when you put it in. And actually, I I did that once by accident, and I kind of liked it so much, I just left it in on the mix. <laughs> it's like, this made my mix sound better. I'm just going to leave it in. You know, this is my new mix bus plugin. Um, but that that those types of things for headphones are, are cool. Get... If you can, open air headphones uh, where the rear side is vented, very important. Uh, that, that plays a huge role in, in making um, the headphones sound uh, better because when you have solid shell um, uh, headphones, what happens is the what comes out of the back side of the speaker because uh, speakers don't feed sound in one direction. They only feed it in one direction because what's coming out the other side is blocked or it's ported, so it comes back at some delay you know, to help you know, supplement the bass or something like that. But sound does go in the opposite direction as well. Uh, and when it goes into a shell, that shell has a certain amount of area 
built into it, cubic um, area into it, and that has a resonant frequency. And usually there is some low mid resonance and buildup of low low mid frequencies that occurs in that situation. So you want to be um, be conscious of that. So um, you know, be aware of that you know there's there's actually never been better sounding headphones and more of them on the marketplace than there is so i don't make specific recommendations uh, i use these ultra i use ultrasound headphones uh, i got them like five years ago and i know them inside and out um i like them a lot um but uh, sort of like a glove, it's not a one-size-fits-all. So you may put these on and say, like, you're insane. These are the worst-sounding, hideous things I've ever heard in my life. And you may put on, you know, a pair of AKGs and say, oh, this is a headphone. And I put it on, and it's like I throw it back in your face, and we get into a big fight and wrestling match and all that sort of stuff. You know, usual things that happen in studio. Um, so, you know, you want to be very careful and find something that actually matches your hearing and your ears. Uh, so, you know, to, so be conscious of that. So I wanted to put that out there because I think this is like a, an important concept to understand in terms of the, um, of the process and preparation, uh, for getting ready to mix. So, uh, with all that said, uh, we'll, uh, wrap this, this lesson up and move on. Um, uh, you will go right on from here to, uh, lesson number seven. <laughs>